Hello and welcome to the EDH Retcast, where we're all about commander data and dad jokes. I'm Joey Schultz and I'm joined at long last. Matt, you're back. I don't even have an intro joke for you. I'm just happy that you're back, man. Hi, it's Matt Morgan. Hey, Joey, what's going on? I actually was on a fishing trip. Um, I was gone a little bit. Uh, and I found that the best music to listen to while you're fishing is always going to be something that has a pretty catchy melody. <laughs> oh, no. Well, uh, Matt, uh, I, I, I like, I, I hope that you were able to carry a tune. Uh, hey, um, hey, I'm hey. going to reel this one in and say that <laughs> I'm glad to be back. I wasn't actually on a fishing trip, but uh, um, it, I am glad to be back and, and, and hanging out. Yeah, I could tell. I, I can tell a setup for a dad joke when I see it, Matthew. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't been fishing in like 10 years. Honestly, yeah. All right, Matt, it is just the two of us on this week's episode. What it is. is it that we are talking about this week? Well, this week we are going to talk about having maybe a little this or that, maybe how you can choose. If you're trying to pick between two different commanders that are maybe doing this, a similar type of thing, how do you navigate that that conversation that you have to have with yourself to picking your proven commander? Yeah, yeah. This is going to be very, very interesting. And it's honestly pretty fitting for us to do this topic while Dana's not actually here with us because we know that his answer every time would just be, well, I'm not going to do the popular one. So we'll go into yeah, some, yeah. Other, <laughs> some other potential we, options. We can talk about popular commanders this week because Dana <laughs> is indeed not here. Yeah. As soon as we would like mention like a lath roll or whatever, he would just be like allergic to it. He's like, no, no, it's popular. I can't. I can't. But yeah, uh, as you said, we do want to observe some of our the, the things that go into our decision making when we're choosing between commanders. And I'm excited to get to it. But we got some shout outs to do before we do. First, I want to thank Chase, also known as Manicurs, for helping with the post-production of the show. Chase, you do such fantastic work. Show could not happen without you. So thank you so much, Manicurs. And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by liking this video, subscribing on YouTube, subscribing to your local podcast app, or you can go to patreon.com slash edhretcast, where we have patron tiers of all sorts of levels. You want to join our Discord community, you can do that for as little as $2 a month. You can also see all of our historic challenge stats picks. There's all that and more over at patreon.com slash edhretcast, including the coveted weekly patron shout out, which I know you all did while I was gone. But this week, James Harris... Uh, I got nothing because we're just going to appreciate the support. I'm turning over a new leaf. It is winter, fall, after all. So, uh, James Harris, thank you so much for your support. We definitely appreciate it. Matt, no way do I believe that you are turning over a new leaf when it comes to making silly jokes. The, the, you caught me. Um, <laughs> I'm still going to make bad, bad name play, but James, thank you for your support regardless. Thank you so, so much, James, for the support. And now, Matt, we will get into our topic here. We're doing a little bit of um, how do we choose between certain commanders? And I think right off of the bat, one of the most like looming shadows in the conversation of like guiding our commander picks is probably going to come down to some color identity stuff and like commanders that give you access to specific colors for the strategy that you want to play. So uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but that seems to be one of the first places that I think we should start. I mean, that absolutely is because that's oftentimes going to help direct what players might be doing in a lot of cases too. Uh, sometimes you, you can't play some strategies without having access to certain colors. And so that's really a big, big thing for players. And of course, if you're like me, you have a certain aversion to certain colors. And so that's <laughs> always going to guide, you know, kind of what you look at as well. So mm -hmm. color influence is absolutely one of the biggest things that we see when when players are considering different decks mm -hmm. yeah and even for you i mean you said that there are certain colors that you avoid like i know that you have a humans deck which is led by kyler sigardian emissary but that's not the only humans deck that's out there there's also like jarena kudro right but that one's in mardu and you much prefer your selesnia or i think you just don't like playing black which I, I don't understand. I fundamentally am just like, if it doesn't have black, I don't, I, I don't understand. Um, so th that's like one probably very easy thing. Like the types of things that both of those two different humans decks are up to are going to feel very different just because of which colors you want to play. Yeah. And a, a very, very good example of this besides just my personal decks, but also I do have a, a landfall deck, but landfall is kind of the, the, the poster child for how many colors do you want in this deck? Because you have just so many options. Mm. Landfall is probably one of the most supported, I would say, themes and strategies in Commander these days, mm. just because you're going to get incidental good cards for Landfall decks, in addition to devoted Landfall type of cards that are going to support the strategy directly. So 
you have just an absolute glut of options when it comes to both what cards you want to play in the 99, but also commanders when it comes to building a landfall deck. Yeah, so you've got Omnath Locus of Rage, although I think you've probably dabbled with other landfall things here and there. But I mean, there are so many, like there's so many different Omnaths mm -hmm. just like sticking to one character. Not to mention there's like AC and Tatiova if you wanted to do Simic and draw cards off of it. You've yep. got Gitrog Monster if you wanted to do stuff in uh, more of the Golgari. There's Lord Windgrace. There's, I mean, there really are plenty. So I guess like starting just broadly there, Matt, you have access to so many different colors for landfall. Why did you initially choose Omnath? And more importantly, why have you stuck with Omnath when it comes to what you want to do with Landfall? So those are two very, very good questions. I, I think the second one is one that I can answer pretty easily and directly. I've stuck with just straight red, green Omnath Locus of Rage because I like to be able to play a high density of basics because so many of those ramp cards, you, there, there are only so many cards that you can play that are going to pull lands out of your deck that are pulling non-basics. Mm -hmm. And when you're playing a Landfall strategy, you need a lot of basics because most of your ramp spells, most of your things that are going to get stuff out of your deck and, and spamming a bunch of your landfall triggers, they're grabbing basics. And not only that, uh, I have a lot of cards that reward me for having basics. Uh, Velikut is a very, very powerful card, Velikut Molten Pinnacle, but I have to have so many mountains in play. And we talked a few weeks back about how good there are that having lands with basic land types on there, but I need a lot of mountains and there aren't enough dual lands with mountain type in there. I have to play a whole bunch of basics. So that's one of the reasons I've stuck around is because I like just having that very linear and straightforward ability mm. to play that strategy and keeping it pretty budget friendly as far as the mana base goes. And, and we all know that lands can be the most expensive part of a deck. <laughs> yeah, th those lands can definitely like if you are going to move into like the teamer Omnath or the four color Omnath and you also wanted to play all of those fetch lands. Yes, that sounds very, very expensive. Yeah. Um, so so that makes sense, especially why you've why you've stuck with it. But I'm, I'm curious, I guess, what drew you to that one in the first place? Uh, it was the, the first question there of like, why did you pick this over the other options? So, so <laughs> as corny as this is, um, I first latched onto Omnath Locus of Rage because it made big creatures that go smash. Okay, there you go. Honestly, that's reason enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and back then, back when I first, because I built the commander right when Battle for Zendarkar came out. So it was a brand new thing. But also that was a long time ago. That was almost 10 years ago at this point where the game was much less evolved back then. Information was much less available. Like we didn't know what EDH rec was back then. So all I saw was a big smashy creature that made more big smashy creatures. And that's really as far as I got in my thought process. And and these days, as you can be as casual as they be or as serious and invested in the game as some people are, you, there's so much information that's just readily available compared to how it was when I built that. So the, the answer is not very technical. It, it just made big creatures and I wanted to do that. That I, I actually, I really love that because I have a landfall deck that went through a lot of different iterations and I actually did toy between sticking with Titania versus Omnath mm -hmm. and Titania, that's the mono green. And the thing that I focused on was actually she cared about sacrificing lands as opposed to I make big creatures. So that's a really big difference between the two of us. Yeah. But like I, I dabbled into, I went to Omnath for a little bit and it wasn't giving me the thing that I wanted, even though it gave me access to more colors. So eventually I did minimize back down to a mono green after a lot of adventuring with <laughs> that, that type of landfall deck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Landfall is a very big example, but there are, I think, a lot of other, uh, even even plenty more classic ones that like you you really are sort of forced to make some pretty big decisions that feel yeah. m much bigger. Like when it comes to I don't know, like toughness matters, for instance. That's one of the bigger like dichotomies that comes to my mind when you're deciding do I pick this or or that. Like Doran, for example, allows you to build a toughness matters deck, mm -hmm. but that's an Obzon as opposed to Arcades, which is toughness matters specifically with a defender bend. Um, but it also I mean that one's in Bond, so uh, sorry Bant. I know I pronounce it weird. I'm sorry. Uh, but like those are two different <laughs> don't make fun of I'm me i'm glad you're catching yourself these days with with bont with your aunt i i, I say obs on and so it just not bont sounds natural i don't i don't i want to say bont i'm sorry um and so arcades versus doran that's another like classic like okay these are some very different colors mm -hmm. and i think this kind of even gets down to like there, there are certain things i think of lathral as another place where like 
color influences a lot here, the color access, because when it comes to building an elf deck, if you want to build Golgari elves, there are some other options like Land of War Abomination, but lord, they are nowhere near as popular as what Lathril has done. Yeah. Lathril has taken off. It's one of the most popular commanders of all time. It's wild. But it really is, like if you were looking at other popular elf options, it's kind of mono green or Golgari Lathril. And so like that, that color stuff can make a huge difference. And that's one of the primary things for us to observe in terms of how we make the choices that we make. Yeah, and, and for me, there has to be some really good incentive to take a deck that I have that's existing and add a color to it. So you, you mentioned Lathril, where for the longest time, it, it was pretty much mono green elves. If you wanted to play an elf type deck, you were playing mono green. Maybe back then you're playing uh, Risk the Redeemed, which gave you Selesnya, but that was more of a just general tokens. It wasn't elf specifically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it really was generally mono green. So what really incentivized people to go into Golgari, and the same thing applies to pretty much any other deck that you might have that gets a, a new commander with a different color splashes. The questions that I ask myself when I see something, like when I see a new Omnath or a new Landfall deck is, what is that color that it's adding giving me that I don't already have? And does it outweigh how clean and smooth the deck has been worked out to be for me at this point? Mm. Is the power that I'm, I'm finding is that outweighing the the upside possibly of adding another color? And that's something that for Lathro players, at least, they very much said, yes, th this is worth adding a color to what already was a pretty streamlined deck. Yeah, it, you've, you've written uh, something down here in the notes that I think is especially prescient to put in here is like, does the color that you're choosing support the strategy that you want to play? Mm -hmm. Because... If, if, for instance, I built a lot of aristocrats decks, like we, we all know this, Joey loves to play black and he loves to sacrifice all of this stuff. Um, and the things that green will offer me when I add that to an aristocrats deck, ooh, I get more creatures, more bodies to sacrifice versus the things that like blue might offer me doing aristocrats. That's a very different conversation. Blue, mostly I'd be like, all right, cool. I get more dot, dot, dot counter magic <laughs> as opposed to the more obvious things that green would be able to enable for me. So it isn't just about like yeah. having the colors. It is very often about which colors specifically and what is it that they contribute that maybe the strategy didn't have before. There's so many different examples of this. I, I think for me, one thing that just stands out to me and you look at the, the numbers, just raw numbers of decks, you have Tasa Karlov and Marin of Clan Neltoth. Mm. Joey, you and I both built one of those commanders, but if you look at Aristocrats pages, those are two of the most commonly built commanders when it comes to Aristocrats decks, but they're in two different colors. Right. And so a good, good, good question that I think folks could be asking themselves is, what is that support color that I want in the deck that's going to back up what I'm trying to do? Is it going to be having the white, having maybe some better creature go wide type of strategy there? Or is it tied to the commander? Is it going to be that... You know, I really want those experience counters. I want to maximize those so that I can pull bigger things out of my graveyard with my Marin being in play. So there's a lot of different questions you have to be asking yourself because even though Tasa and Marin do very similar things, they actually don't when you think about it because <laughs> they're approaching it in different colors. They're doing it in a very different way. Um, so there's a lot to kind of break down for yourself when you're weighing that color balance. Yeah, I think one of the biggest guides for me when it comes to that type of thing as well, it isn't just the color access and ooh, which specific spells or support pieces do I get, but also how does it shape the win condition? Yeah. Genuinely, that's become one of the biggest things that I pay attention to these days, especially if there can be a little bit of variability with my win conditions. That way, every game doesn't end exactly the same way. So when it comes to if I were to you know, be weighing up, hmm, I want to do aristocrats, am I thinking of Tesa or am I thinking of Marin? The specific abilities of the commanders, that is another, like, obviously very big thing for me. I, I tend to be a very commander-focused builder. But also, what is the shape of the win condition that each of these would allow me to do? And so, for example, like, I, I love sacrificing a bunch of mitotic slimes and gruff triplets because I think they're just hilarious. <laughs> so, like, those are fun things that I might be like, ooh, that might drive me more towards green as opposed to maybe a, a little bit more of the Alend of the Dusk Rosy kind of things or the Mirkwood Bats uh, kind of things that I might find mm -hmm. a little bit more pronounced in a Tesa deck instead. Um, th those little differences, specifically the, the wind condition and the way that that is shaped as you make one of those choices, wind conditions becomes one of the, the biggest things that I pay attention to. Yeah, the, it's a great way. And, but also like there's so many really good support cards because I mean, you look at some other commanders that are maybe doing similar things. And I mean, it really, you're almost not even color bound anymore. You can play any given strategy in almost any color combination these days 
So it just really depends on how creative you want to get. But again, the colors are going to help kind of dictate and put boundaries on what you're able to do. And, you know, they say restrictions read creativity. So if you're trying to do an aristocrat's deck in Simic colors, you can, I guess, but God bless your journey. <laughs> uh, honestly, challenge accepted. Okay. I mean, that, that, that's fine right there. <laughs> so Matt, to kind of move into some other examples here, I, I think one of the most pronounced, like this or that type of things that might exist out there for a lot of players is one of the most famous creature types out there in the game's entire history. Folks who are choosing between the Ur Dragon and Miram Sentinel Worm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like this is definitely related to the color discussion because one of those is five colors and the other one is just three colors, just Teemer. But Lord, both of them are so powerful that sometimes you're just like, yeah, I don't know if I need the white and black because Miram can double up the number of dragons that I'm making and has got Ward. So beyond, I guess, just color access, which obviously is a very valid thing. Like if you want to play five color dragons, the Ur dragon is more obviously going to be the thing. But like what would pull you more towards one or the other in addition to that? Like are there specific things about these commanders abilities or other things that they enable that makes you lean one way or the other? Oh, that that's a really good question because they're they're both wildly popular. Both are played in oh, 15,000 decks, which is a huge number yeah. considering that they have a a ton of competition for dragon typal decks, but also just commanders in general. Those are two of the most played commanders of all time. So a mm. lot of competition. The fact that these are able to stand out is huge. But to me, I, Ur Dragon versus Myram breaks down to, do you want a critical mass of just, I just want as many dragons as, as I can possibly get. I don't care what they are, because that's going to be the Ur dragon for sure. Hmm. Or do you want, I want a dozen copies of the absolute best dragon I can find, because that's going to be my room. And so it, neither is really wrong because both are very, very powerful. It's kind of silly how good both of them can be, but I, that's a question that you have to ask as you're brewing the deck is, do I, is it worth it adding two more colors to get access to some different dragons? Or do I just want to pick the best dragons in r red, green, and, and blue, which are arguably the kind of the, the better dragon colors anyways. So there's a lot of questions that you kind of have to ask. And that's, that's at least where my mind goes when I'm comparing these two. No, I think that's a, a great way to describe it. Sort of related to that when like folks are building like a, a tokens deck versus a Voltron deck, there's the issue of going wide versus going tall. I think that's potentially a, a lens that we can use to, to view the differences between these two here. Like, is it, that, as you said, that critical mass? Or is it about like one particular thing and you keep on doing that one particular thing <laughs> over and over again? Um, and as you said, like, they're both good. Like, this episode is not about us saying, oh, this one's better than that one for this. No, no, no. We're just trying to observe what is it that informs the decisions that we end up making here? Yeah, and for you, yeah. it comes down to that critical mass stuff. Do I just want to play all of the best stuff? Or is there a specific song that you want to keep singing over and over again during that game? For me, when it comes to these, I think the commander-centricness of those decks is what is taking the most prominent focus. You can play very successful Ur-Dragon games without ever having to cast the Ur-Dragon. It just facilitates a strategy because it has that eminence ability to just make dragons easier to cast. Whereas Miram feels like, like, yeah, you probably don't need to cast Miram for that deck to still go. I mean, dragons are always busted, but a lot of the strategy of that deck tends to be, I get Miram in play and then I'm going to really go haywire. And if people can get rid of your commander, that is probably going to stop you up a little bit more. So for me, the thing that I pay attention to is how critical is the commander to the strategy? That's a whole other axis of kind of questions that you have to ask yourself and, and preferences because, Joey, I, I'm kind of like you. If I hear one new song, I'm going to listen to it about 30 times in a row. <laughs> then I'll listen to a different song. So, yeah, I, I do like having a commander play a big part in my game plan. That's that's kind of a theme in any deck that I build. Um, so, yeah, t if I were probably building them, I probably would go to Myram. But, again, that's a personal preference question that we, we can't really answer for everybody here. Because, yeah, again, we're not trying to tell you what to do. We're trying to help ask questions to each other to help maybe influence and guide you, the listener, as you're trying to make these hard decisions when you're building your next deck. Right. And well, another more recent example of this is also going to be like dinosaurs. Like we just had the Ixalan, uh, the Lost Caverns of Ixalan stuff came out. And with them came a new dinosaur commander, which was Puntlaza the Sun Favored. Um, and, and that is potentially another option that you could use if you want to play Naya Dinosaurs. But 
that means that it's got competition with Gishath, which is a very popular Naya Dino commander. And here again, we have some like, ooh, okay, like if I were to build Naya Dinosaurs, now I do have to kind of ask, which one of these am I going to stick with and, and why would that be? Pontlaza will allow you to discover, which is sort of a new cascade ability. Every time you get dinosaurs on anyone's turn, you can get that discover ability once per turn. And that is a great way to fuel up your stuff, get a bunch of other things into play. Whereas Gishath is that one hit and then I rip that many cards off the top of my deck and all the dinos from there go into play for free. So they're both cheating things into play but they have some subtle differences about them. I know a lot of people will say, oh, I prefer to stick with Gishath. A lot of people will say, I want to try something new. Matt, if it were to be handed to you with the dinos, what has you pointing in which direction? Yeah, so these two specifically between Gishath and Pentlaza, I'm kind of looking at the potential of Gishath where if you hit somebody, you're going to possibly get a, a handful of new things out. But you might also bust a little bit. You may not hit a whole lot. Mm. And so when you look at Penlaza, you have the consistency there. So you're able to, as long as you're getting something into play, you don't need to worry about hitting somebody, dealing that combat damage, and potentially whiffing as well. You can just churn through your deck. So there's going to be a little bit more consistency there. If maybe the downside, uh, or the downside of it being you're going to not be near as explosive. I mean, Gishath... There's all the potential, all the boom bust in the world, whereas you know what you're going to get maybe a little more consistently with the new dinosaur leader. So those are the two questions that I'm looking at specifically there, because Pantlaza, it's only going to be as big as whatever you're already getting into play. And so because you're discovering X, that's it's that creature's toughness. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of hard to say, whereas Gishath, I mean, everybody knows how explosive a Gishath deck can be. Oh, oh, yeah. Gishath is the 15th most popular commander on the website. It's got 14,000 decks to its name. It's hard to unseat that titan. Um, I, I love the, the categorization there. I think I had different words in my head, but I'm going to like actually use your words instead. I think I, I've characterized Pontlaza as being more forgiving than Gishath. Like, it can help yeah, that's make, a good way to put it. make up for it. But like, consistency is, I think, a better word there because Pontlaza, from the moment that you play it, it's going to start cascading into probably smaller stuff and get you potentially more uh, random resources into play that will enable you to play bigger and bigger stuff later on. Gishath is again very like commander centric. If someone uses a, a a random path to exile on your commander as it's trying to attack, you will completely whiff off of that Gishath attack. Um, and, and that can be pretty tough. That could be a reason that people want to move away from Gishath if they feel that they can't protect it enough and then therefore they're not getting the payoff from hitting an opponent. But that explosivity Dang, it's hard to argue with explosivity sometimes. That yeah, is yeah. the exciting part of Commander. So consistency versus explosiveness is a great categorization. And I'm kind of with you on that. I think that those are really great metrics to use when trying to pick. Yeah, just do you, do you want a bigger floor? Or do you want a higher ceiling? Uh, that's Oh, yeah. yeah there, there's so many different ways that we can put this. Um, do you want to do a challenge of stats segment or not? Kind of the same thing. You're crying um, out loud. <laughs> All right. I, I may have been gone, but I didn't lose my edge. No. I'm not rusty. You've been, you've been sitting on that one for the two weeks while you've been away, huh? <laughs> it, it took me two weeks to come up with that segue, yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, yeah. Ah, oh, my dignity. All right, yeah. So we do have... <laughs> There's a lot of data on EDH track, but we don't always agree with it. So we will take a quick break and come back to our main topic after we challenge some stats. <laughs> Dang it, Matt. Well, and since it's been a little bit since I've got to do a challenge of stats, I wanted to bring one to the table that actually a listener did send it to us. So Noah Kane sent us an email, which you can do too, edhretcast at gmail.com mm -hmm. and submit a challenge. And this one I really liked. I do like it for the commander they specifically said, but I like it for one of my own decks as well. So Noah sent us the email and said, Talrand, Sky Summoner, great spell slinger, value commander, um, easy to do budget list with and one five mana, pretty reasonable spell. That is an overrun type of finisher for the deck is Candle Keep Inspiration. Oh, so yeah. Candle Keep Inspiration is four and a blue with, for a sorcerer that says until end of turn, creatures you control have base power and toughness XX, where X is the number of cards you own in exile and in your graveyard that are instant cards or sorcery cards and or have an adventure. Um, so this is a overrun effect for as many instances of sorceries that you have that you've already gotten out of your library. Uh, this is pretty powerful and the drakes that you're making already have flying which means they have a pretty good chance of connecting as well it's just great for having a payoff card for what you already want to be doing and i agree with all that this 
All those things are very true. It's in 24% of Talran decks. Where I especially like Candlekeep Inspiration, though, is in my Ovika Enigma Goliath deck. So that is the Is It Spellslinger deck, where it rewards you for having uh, for whenever you cast bigger spells. So whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you create X11 red Phyrexian creature goblin tokens, where X is the mana value of that spell, and they gain haste until end of turn. So the interaction I really, really like with this is that you cast... Candlekeep Inspiration, you're going to get five tokens with Ovika out on the battlefield already. And then you're going to have the spell resolve. You're going to have Candlekeep Inspiration resolve and make all those goblins that have haste suddenly turn into these XX power toughness creatures that still have the haste. They're, this is absolutely silly with Ovika. I love this challenge so much. Uh, it's a quarter. This Candlekeep Inspiration is a very, very cheap card. So Noah... I absolutely love this because, I mean, putting Overrun into non-green colors, abs sign me up. That's what I'm here to do. So Noah, thank you so much for the email. Thank you for the amazing challenge stats. I, I am here for all of this. Oh man, I really enjoy that interaction. Can Cancel of Inspiration is just a, a really cool card, but it's even cooler when like it can be the only spell that you need to cast once your commander's in play, and then it can just yeah. run over your opponents, which is bonkers. Um, and it's another another card from the worst set of all time in, in Baldur's Gate, which... Oh my god, Matt... You, I, I can't even say that with straight face. It's one of our favorite sets. I, I was going to say, it's like, you know that the internet will not understand the sarcasm, and a lot of people have... I know. Uh, have, ...are pretending that they never said anything bad about that. That's now know. that the game has been taking over their minds. The, the, the pretending is the keyword there. But anyways, Joey, I haven't heard any of your challenges for a couple weeks. I, I want to hear it now. <laughs> All right. Yeah, uh, it's fitting that we brought up the dinos earlier because my challenge for this week actually is for Punt Laza Sun Favored. Um, I want to talk about the card of Roaming Throne in that deck. Roaming Throne, I, I, I th that, this card's cracked. This card's absolutely cracked. But Pontlaza is one of the only places where that card is actually probably not appropriate. I'm being a little bit facetious there. We can calm down. Uh, Roaming Throne is the four mana golem artifact, a four four with ward two for some reason uh, that says as it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type, and it is the chosen type in addition to its other types, and it doubles the triggered abilities of each of your other creatures of that type. So that can be very, very interesting for a lot of stuff. My main contention with this card is that I don't think you need to put it into a deck that cares about just one creature type. Just doubling up your commander's triggers in general is already very, very powerful to do, and I don't know why they decided to give Ward 2 to a thing that can do that in any deck ever. I digress. Pontlaza is one of the few places where I'd be a little bit skeptical of it, though. If you're trying to double up all of your other dinosaurs' triggered abilities, I can kind of understand that. But specifically, my issue with it is that it doesn't work for Pontlaza's ability specifically, because Pontlaza has that ability of whenever you get dinos, you discover X, and discover is equal to their toughness, but it says do this only once each turn. So Roaming Throne ends up being a non-bow with that because it will copy the triggered ability, but that second trigger won't do anything because Pontlaza says, I do this only once each turn. So once that second ability resolves, it's like, oh, I, I've already done it, so I can't do it again. I'm not going to. So that ability will have no effect, basically. There are a couple of interesting commanders out there that have a similar type of like, do this only once each turn kind of thing to pay attention to. So if you are trying to copy those triggered abilities, if they say do this only once each turn, pay very, very careful attention to them because it's not actually going to do what you want. So uh, yeah, just an important non-bow to be aware of and that the wording on that is specific and you have to keep that in mind so do this only once each turn is different than something that says this only triggers once each turn right so you can copy it if as long as it triggers but if you only do this once per turn you're not able to copy it you're, you're absolutely right joey that the wording on these is tricky it's almost like this game is very complex and you need to be, need to be careful about what you're doing but this is a great catch it's even trickier than you made it out matt because you can copy it it's just that the copy of the ability won't do anything won't okay there, <laughs> so, there you, you, you copy but moral of the story is roaming throne is nuts roaming throne is nuts this is one of the only times where i could be like all right i think i wouldn't play it here but like i'm looking at that card for a bunch of my other decks and i'm like worried because i'm just like this it's so good it's so good i should not be allowed to double up some of my commander's abilities i should you should not allow certain colors to have two abilities of their commanders like nope as if it wasn't already enough that we were making a ton of non-legendary clones this year anyway I think that if I were to anyway. stay on that tangent, I would we would have to change the name of this uh, podcast topic. And so we should just get back on focus, Matt. Yeah. When we're getting back into the main topic of our show, where should we go next? 
So I, I think a really good transition that we can make here is we we love the pre-constructed decks that Magic has been putting out there for the past few years as a podcast. You know, I, all three of us agree the pre-constructed decks are, are great. They're, they keep getting better. And one thing that we've noticed, at least I especially have noticed because of my huge love for pre-constructed decks, is that the the secondary commanders in these decks, they're not completely unrelated to the main commander anymore. Most often, mm. they're still pretty good. You can swap them interchangeably in a lot of situations. So what happens if you buy one of these new pre-cons and you don't know what commander to play? How, how do you handle that? Because... I all three of us have ripped open pre -con, pre cons lately, and they're all great. And you can play either commander. Yeah, and I think that like we still do see some of that going on here and there, but it is definitely there's a lot mm -hmm. more convergence happening. I would say like yeah, I, I don't know. As a quick easy example to sort of like highlight what you mean there, like the Wilhelt precon that I got, the secondary commander was Eloise, a human who makes clues, and I'm like that ain't got nothing to do with my zombies. So I know that I'm not playing you out of the box when it comes to this, but. You got a precon a little while ago, which was the, uh, I think it was the Mardu Legends. Is that right? I did. That had Dihada and uh, Shanid. And both of those are Mardu Legends that care about other Mardu Legends. And that was a lot more of a tough call in terms of like, okay, um, hmm, which one do I go with here? And so, yeah, how did you end up making that decision? That actually was a pretty hard decision because both of them are very, very powerful. Dahada just being a planeswalker in general lends itself to being a little being able to do a little bit more than I normally do in my my decks. Mm. But the cool thing about Shanid was that just gives you so much velocity. You really get to crank through your deck when you're playing that. And that's one thing I absolutely love is just get being able to just draw all the cards, just really crank through and just get to what you want to be doing. And so it was, I played both, honestly. I, I settled on Shanid because I just absolutely, I've been mean, putting another creature, getting something that's going to just have that engine attached to it. That's where I, I kind of settled on. But I don't think anybody's going to be wrong because Dihada just being able to tick up, make any other legendary creature indestructible, give it lifelink. Those are two hugely powerful abilities for just any creature that's going to be, for the most part, on the battlefield when you're playing that deck. Matt, it's so, <laughs> this is just how our brains work differently. I agree with you that Shanid has a great amount of velocity because whenever you play legendary stuff, including legendary lands, you get to lose a life and draw a card. And that's absolutely, you're right. I totally yep. love that. Yep. It's so funny to me that our minds work differently though, because you're talking about velocity with Shanid and I'm looking at Dihada's minus three ability to put a bunch of stuff in your graveyard. And I'm like, that's the velocity right there. <laughs> no, so, no, you can't cast it if it's in your graveyard. No, you can resurrect it if it's in your graveyard. Man. I don't that's care about velocity. that. I don't, no, no, wrong. No, no, it's going to the wrong place. No, the graveyard's the best place for it. But I think here, the, the thing that would catch my eye, velocity is a great thing that you've uh, cottoned onto there. I think also like versatility comes to mind when it comes to this particular decision. Like mm -hmm. it's clear that Dihada has a lot more potential that she can do. And that is a good thing and also sometimes a very bad thing. Like it's it's nice to have those you know, this commander has different options, so there's more flexibility with me while I am brewing it. But sometimes you do want a commander that isn't like, all right, I can go in 90 different directions because a little bit more focus, a little bit more direction from the lead of your deck can actually make it easier for you to cut those final three cards when you're looking at your 103 card pile and being like, what do I get rid of? Yeah. So th that can sometimes be a, a bad thing if a commander is trying to do too many things at once. I don't think that's the case for Dihada. I think Dihada is very, very good. But the fact that she cares about so many different keywords with her plus ability that she cares about treasures and about the graveyard with her last ability, and that she's a planeswalker that you have to defend as well. She's doing a lot more where she need feels more streamlined. So I think versatility is the the thing that I pay attention to here most. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I just plus Dihada doesn't really do a whole lot on her own. You need to have a board kind of going in order for Dihada to be good. Mm. Whereas Shanid, you play it and then you just keep developing your board and keep developing developing your board, and you kind of go about it from there. So that's just kind of where I settled on. That's how I kind of played through it. So what about you, Joey? So what was the most recent pre-con you got and how did you navigate picking the commander for it? 
Uh, you're not going to like this. Um, the most recent break. Uh, probably not. The, the, we, <laughs> we, we diverge on a lot of things, but we can we can come together on talking about it. Yeah, the, the most pre-con, uh, recent pre-cons that I got were the Doctor Who pre-cons. And I know that you just don't care about, about Doctor Who, but I've been having a, yep. a, a pretty fun time with them. And in general, I feel like for the most part, they are, are really good with the commanders that are right there at the front face, the Davros pre-con especially. Um, but I did change up one of them when I was playing the historic one, which was uh, led by the fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane Smith. Uh, I actually wound up going with the sixth Doctor instead of that. And, and the reason for that kind of came down to a wind condition in the command zone versus an engine in the command zone. And this is kind of a, a weird example for me to get to, but work with me here, folks. Sarah Jane Smith, in, ter in terms of the deck, she would give you clue tokens, so she could be a little bit of a source of card advantage for me. And the fourth Doctor also would let you play historic stuff off of the top of your deck, so also card advantage. For me, I was like, I don't know if I want double card advantage for both of the commanders that this is doing. So I went to the sixth Doctor, which can uh, copy the historic stuff that you play, so you get more stuff in play. Because to me, it felt like that precon needed a little bit more punching power compared to you know, what the villain's deck was up to, for example. So I don't usually put win conditions in my command zone. Um, they're, more often, I, I tend to put engines into my command zone. In this particular case, since Sarah, the companion, and the Sixth Doctor could both be there and I could get the best of both worlds, that's why I erred on, on that side. But yeah, win condition versus engine in the command zone is another thing that I pay a whole lot of attention to. And that was a more recent thing that I went through when I was looking at some recent precons that I got. So that's a very lengthy answer to your question there, Matt. <laughs> that is a really good question, I think, is how much card advantage in the command zone is too much or how much of anything in the command zone is too much because you really had two options. So do you want to put more of those those engine cards in the command zone or do you want something that's going to actually have some sort of payoff? And I think that's really what makes companions or partner, any of those types of legendary creatures so powerful is you really get a chance to kind of pick what you think the deck needs and then fill out the deck from there. And so having that versatility and and giving you a chance to really explore because of the doctor's companion mechanic or whatever whatever variant of partner you have, it's a really, really cool opportunity to kind of flex those deck building muscles that any given player might have because there are so many different options and just creativity is a chance to really be expressed there. Well, and to be honest, I feel like that's not even like, because uh, because again, like most of the decks that I build are very like the engine is in the command zone, like Babala Saga, for example. I know I bring her up all the time, but like she's card draw. She's giving you more stuff. So that is like the engine right there. Or the same goes for the Wilhelt deck that I've got. In fact, heck, zombies. I mean, zombies, that was a huge, there are so many different zombie commanders out there, Matt. Do you know how many zombie commanders out there? There's there a lot. so many commanders out there for zombies. Um, and so I really cottoned on to Wilhelt because that gradual card draw and giving the decayed zombies there was more that I could do there versus other famous ones like the Scarab God, which drains life from your enemies. So for the most part, I tend to be attracted to like the engine in the command zone as opposed to the wind condition in the command zone. But every so often, you know, that, that isn't always going to be the case. Sir Conrad is another deck of mine where I do have a, a wind condition in the command zone there instead of the engine that's, you know, making the deck chug, uh, you know, in, in the first place. Um, but like, yeah, when it, when it comes to precons, especially, I think that that's another thing that I had to pay attention to just recently because of getting those decks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's just so many really cool options with these these pre-constructed decks out of the box. So I, I know when we were at the Magic Summit a, a while back, we all got to open up pre-constructed decks and play them against each other. And I, I had, obviously, I picked the Selesnya deck because I needed an Enchantress deck, and, and why not? But the deck that I was actually the most impressed with, no matter what commander people chose to play, was the Fairies deck. So whether it was Alila Cunning Conqueror mm. or Tegwill Duke of Splendor. Both of those commanders just out of the box played so stinking well <laughs> with how the deck was playing. Whether it was, I mean, Tegwell, whenever a fairy you control dies, you draw a card and lose a life. So that, that's very, very powerful and it pumps up your fairies. But then also just being able to cast spells at any given time and feeding Alila's abilities. Those are also just, it's so great seeing you know, you, you have a little bit of something for everybody, no matter what the pre-constructed deck is. Whether you want to be a little more clever about it, you just want to put the engine there. There's a lot of flexibility with these pre-constructed decks out of the box. And I, I I know I'm a broken record with this, but like I just <laughs> love how the... I don't think it can happen, but then they keep making these pre-constructed decks better. I, I think there's also potentially a conversation to have here too about like... Uh, uh, Fairies was already 
like a big thing. Uh, but by the time that this particular precon came out, that was already an archetype that had been like decently fleshed out before, but now it was getting even more fleshed out. Yeah, yeah. And there's kind of a difference between like what I might choose based off of how fleshed out that archetype is or that creature type is or anything like that. Um, just because like I I'm thinking of, uh, I don't know, to, to bring it to some Lord of the Rings stuff, because I know that you love the Lord of the Rings, like mm -hmm. the food deck that came out, like I feel like the Lord of the Rings set in particular made the food strategy more viable in a really, really cool way. And then Wilds of Odrain expanded upon that too. And now we're getting a couple of other cool food things. But like choosing between Sam and Frodo versus Merry and Pippin in that case, like I, I saw that one of those had a bit more, to me, I was actually more attracted to Merry and Pippin from that deck because I think they had a bit more firepower. And that firepower is what helps put that thing on the map in the first place. As opposed to when it comes to the, the fairy one, you were just like, it doesn't seem to matter which one, because it turns out fairies already have plenty of good stuff going for them. So you can potentially be a little bit more flexible in that way. I don't know. Maybe I'm completely wrong. I'll defer to your expertise when it comes to anything Lord of the Rings. But I just wanted to be like, when a, a deck is trying to introduce a strategy versus flesh out a strategy mm -hmm. that is already very well fleshed out, I think that also affects our decisions. Yeah, I think that's absolutely a solid point to add. I mean, if we finally ever maybe do get an energy related commander, <laughs> whenever we go back, we know that we're uh, getting one from the Fallout stuff. Actually, we're getting Jeskai energy. Oh, uh, well, that, but that's not Teamer, and that's not. What... I know you want a Teamer energy. I, know, I... <laughs> flavor, flavor fail. Get out of here. Uh, but but yes, now that we are finally getting an energy related commander, I think that people are just going to flock to that. I it's it's a strategy that doesn't really have a whole lot of attention we've we've seen it before but like the the food pre-constructed deck with with sam and frodo or mary and pippin if you're if you're joey <laughs> there's just there's so much potential there there's so much space to be explored and people really are looking for some more help in trying to pull off this otherwise not very well supported mechanic versus I mean, there, there's all sorts of other things that we can be, we can say, I mean, if it was just gonna be another landfall deck, then like, it's <laughs> right. kind of a who cares because we have so much there, but exploring something that doesn't have a whole lot of support already, that's when I think players get very, very excited, which is, I mean, I think that's why the, the absent colored pre-constructed deck from Lord of the Rings was so popular because they didn't really have a whole lot of ways to play that before. Yeah, and we do also d definitely see, I mean, like the differences in the numbers between Mary and Pippin versus Sam and Frodo is staggering. Like one of those is a way more popular. Very, very much. A lot of people building that deck out there completely disagree with me. So again, I defer to other people when it comes to Lord of the Rings stuff. I just saw that, like, I, I was like, oh, I know how I'm going to win with a brand new strategy when it comes to one of these versus the other one that is a lot more engine focused. Um, but yeah, the fact is that it was putting something onto the map. And I think we really tend to see that disparity in terms of the popularity of commanders when a strategy is being first introduced. We've the difference between like Yuriko versus Satoru Umazawa, for instance. Lord, Yuriko is so popular compared to anything else that ninjas could be up to. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And Satoru Umazawa is popular. 10,000 decks. Uh, that That's popular. But Yuriko's at 18,000. And again, that's just like absolutely buck wild to me. Um, and I guess like another one that kind of comes to mind here that is maybe not so much the case for, I don't know, maybe this does count as uh, fleshing out the strategy. Maybe it counts as something a little bit new, but like th there was another OBS on precon that we got this year, which was the toxic precon, which had Ixhel and Vishgraz. Uh, Matt, did you ever flirt around with infect stuff at all? How would you have approached that precon at all? So I didn't mess around with this. Uh, I, I like infect in small doses, and I don't know if I could have built a whole deck around it, hmm. but I understand the appeal there because I, again, Triumph of the Hordes, I, it still wins games. <laughs> yeah. But if I were stuck between Ixel, Scion of Atraxa, and Vishgraz the Doomhive, I think I would have gone with Ixel because it, I feel like there's a little more potential there. Yes, Vishgraz does get bigger. It gets plus one, plus one for each poison counter your opponents have. And it creates a whole bunch of, of creatures with toxic one, but you, it doesn't matter how big it is. It only has toxic one. So it's only dealing that one toxic, getting that one poison counter. Mm. Whenever you connect with Vishgraz versus Ixel, I feel like you're able to just really crank through, just get so much advantage from that. That's where I would have gone. But I mean, people are playing both decks still. People like both commanders. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a lot of discussion uh, to be had between these two. I, I think um, Mr. Infect, Craig Blanchett, uh, 
he specifically recommended Excel as another reason here of like shoring up a specific weakness of the strategy. He's played a whole lot of Infect and he noted that card advantage was frequently a thing that he stumbled on or that struggled with a lot in his Infect playing. And Excel, you know, once your opponents are corrupted and they have enough poison counters, you can start stealing cards from them. Um, that does shore up that weakness. And I think that's probably another thing that would inform my decision here when it comes to something like that is like, does this commander in addition to like putting a new strategy onto the map or, or fleshing things out or whatever also like is it approaching that strategy in a new way and specifically in a new way that is productive because of the problems that that strategy has maybe had before or that prevented it from getting off the ground in the first place i think Vishgraz still has plenty to recommend about it i think that might be the one that i'm potentially even more i'm just like oh i see tokens and i think oh what kind of sacrifice but <laughs> in terms of like the actual <laughs> i know i have a one track mind i'm sorry um uh, it's you you have a type and we 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 get it but yeah, it, it's sort of like, you know, I look at these and honestly, this is kind of a weird comparison to make, but I look at Ixel, which is shoring up like, oh, maybe Infect struggles with card advantage a little bit. And, and I think of Giada, Font of Hope, as a, sort of a corollary to this, which was the angel that can tap for mana. Sure. Because angels are famously very, very expensive to cast. So that was shoring up a slight weakness of some of the angel commanders that we had had previously. Yeah. And so that is, again, a thing that I find myself paying attention to. And I just think that's very instructive when you're comparing the different options you've got out there. Okay, so what about some commanders then that like maybe maybe you want to play one of these new pre-constructed decks but the commander that you chose maybe has a reputation already do do you worry oh. when you're playing especially pre-constructed decks do you ever worry if a, a commander or a deck draws too much attention to itself maybe it punches above its where it tries to punch above its weight class how how do you handle those types of situations Oh man. Oh, that that's a, that's a really good question. Um, because that absolutely does factor into my decisions when I build a deck. I, I actually don't know if it's as much of a factor when I'm doing a pre-con, maybe just because it is so new to me, I don't know what reputation um, sure. to expect or, to, uh, or to, to live in if I am playing that deck. But it certainly does become pretty clear pretty quickly with those. <sighs> And, and let's also, Matt, let's be honest. I have a Sir Conrad deck. Like the reputation you, of a you commander do. is and like. I, I would dare say, Joey, that you are part of the reason that reputation <laughs> exists. I guess what I'm saying is that I don't have a good perspective to lend there because when it comes to reputation, a lot of the, the tactic that I am willing to play in a game is like, like yeah, I'm willing to be the bad guy. It's just like, I'll, I'll be a little bit of an arch enemy yeah. if I need to. So maybe that's something that attracts me to a commander, um, even if it takes me a while to see exactly why that arch enemy thing is going to be the case. Um, I, I imagine you might have a different answer to your own question there. Like, does the <laughs> reputation uh, affect your decisions when you're first starting off about what you pick? Uh, it depends. So if it, if it's in one of the, the extremes where it's the the Corvolds or whatever you want to say, the the Turgrids, I mean, get out of here. <laughs> I try to stay away from the, the most popular commanders, but I, if a commander just calls to me, I don't mind. But I also, I will know that going into building the deck that um, I, I need to kind of b build it in a way that's going to live up to the reputation. I, I can't. You can't slow roll like, oh, okay, this is my Moldrotha plus one plus one counters deck anymore. It's very, very hard to build a commander that has a reputation that doesn't get you targeted, at least out the gates. And mm. I, I know that Lenny Woolley writes articles over EDA Trek about combating this problem. Hey, yeah. I, I'll, I'll love to Lenny, but that that type of hurdle, I I would rather just build the deck in a way that's going to live up to the to the reputation then try to avoid it altogether. That's that's a very interesting uh, tactic. I, I can totally appreciate that. And again, shout out to Lenny. Seriously, go check out his articles. They're very, very, very good work. And uh, but you are right. It is a a tough hill to try and climb if you're going to like try you know reframe how people understand the Edgar Markovs of the world and things like that. That is uh, you you are you are signing yourself up for a, a very big challenge accepted type of moment. Yeah, I like that. Reputation is a really great thing to pay attention to when you're choosing between the different commanders. And, and you know, I think as my like last observation about this, and I don't know if I have a great example right off the top of my head, but like I also am very intrigued by like, does this commander, the, does the one that I end up choosing, does it enable me to play some stupid pet cards? <laughs> like, yeah, that's, yeah. That's a thing also like the final thing. It's not just about the colors. It's not just about the abilities. It's not just about the reputation. It's not just about the commander centricness or any of that. It's also like, all right. 
if if I were to build Nalia de Arnis, I'd be able to play the party stuff. But if I were to build Barakos, then I'd get to play Vat of Rebirth. And I've been really excited to play Vat of Rebirth. <laughs> so like <laughs> that's I think also another frame of mind that, that, that I kind of get into. It's like, does this one let me do my, my dumb shenanigans? I mean, that's kind of why I still have my Vivictus Asmati, the dire deck, mm. because I just want to play big dumb creatures <laughs> and cheat them into play somehow. Yeah, yeah. So like and plus, like two of my favorite cards from the recent Lord of the Rings set, Last March of the Ents and Doors of Durin, both let me do that. Yeah, and I still haven't gotten either to resolve. I, I haven't gotten say. to play. <laughs> I, I haven't gotten to play the deck in a little bit. But the last time that I tried to cast Last, last March of the Ents, it can't be countered. But you can Narset's reversal that. So I'm yes. still <laughs> waiting for the day that I can resolve a Last March of the Ents. It's going to happen. But today is not that day. Matt, you're going to be so upset with me. In your absence, I told that story. Um, <laughs> oh, that's fine. That's fine. It's re it's relevant to this episode, though. And I, it, it, I know. It's just it's my favorite story maybe ever. I just I'm, I hope that one day it's going to happen for you, buddy. <laughs> it, it will happen. I am I am determined. But yeah, it, I've, that's the only reason I have my Vevictus deck around anymore. It's just it, it all my pet cards all of these old cards from like 2012 that I still want to play, yeah. that's where these go. And I absolutely love it. So yes, th that is absolutely a reason to not just build a deck or pick a certain commander, but just to keep a deck around is because you get to play pet cards. And this is commander. This is the format for playing literally whatever you want to play. Yeah, I would almost say that like the ability for the deck to let you do stuff with pet cards might be even like one of the bigger ingredients for its longevity to me. Yeah, like yeah. that and the variance of its win conditions are, are things that prevent me from ever getting bored with that deck too quickly. And so those are those are definitely some of the bigger things that I pay attention to. But any one of these factors that we've talked about can be like the thing that makes or breaks or swings you in one direction versus another. Uh, th there are a lot of really good commanders out there. <laughs> there are, Matt, there are so many commanders out there and there are they're coming up with more and more every single month uh so like paying attention to what informs your decisions is uh it, it's been a fun exercise thank you for uh going on this journey with me because i feel like i've learned a lot about how you think and i've learned a lot about how i think and uh, i need to figure out how yeah. it is that i think <laughs> well and, and sometimes too just i'm i'm the type of person i have to talk things out for myself to really understand yeah. how i'm thinking and feeling and so just having this exercise every now and then just with, with a buddy, with, with, with you and I doing this or, or talking with another person that plays Magic, it's just a good exercise to do, I think, not just for newer players, but for everybody, just kind of reset and just like, okay, what's really keeping me around? Why, why do I want to keep this deck around? Mm -hmm. We have those types of conversations in our, our Discord server with all of our patrons. Yep. That's happening all the stinking time. And so it's it's a really, really good exercise. I, I, I love doing this and kind of, well, what draws me? What keeps me to a certain commander? And just kind of talking that out for yourself. Yeah. And maybe, you know, in talking it out, maybe one of these days we'll each have the type of clarity that Dana has where he can simply say, if it's popular, <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> One yep, that things. is a sim simple, simple question to answer. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, with Matt, with that, I, I think, Matt, we are going to call this episode to a close. But if our listeners want to get in touch with us, where is it that they can find you online? Well, you can find me on pretty much any social media platform at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. Don't forget, Wednesday evenings, we do stream over at twitch.tv slash EDH Recast. And we have guests on all the time. It's a super good, super good environment to just jam games, be fun, have have good times. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz online, most likely being a fool on Instagram or something like that. And you can find the cast at EDH Retcast everywhere online. And if you've got a question for us, you can contact us at EDH Retcast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for their fantastic work in the post-production of the show. You can find them online at Mana Curves. Listeners, we'd love to hear from you about the different decisions that go into how do you pick which commander you're going to play, and we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Wreck your deck.